Hello, there's a microphone. Okay, thank you for coming here. Some of you uh, are from Goethe Institute, some of you are not. Uh, I don't mean working for the Goethe Institute, I mean our previous events in Goethe Institute. So this is part of the Female Game Festival, uh, and we're doing a comic, a special version. Uh, apart from all the serious talks and fun workshops, it's the book talk by Marie. Um, She's the author, like the author in the sense she drawed everything and wrote everything of this comic book. It's called, if you don't like the game, change the rules. Uh, it's really a lot of work behind uh, this book. Has already been done before the birth of this book because it's based on a lot of survey, research, interview, real people's experience. And then there's this comic. Maybe we will talk about it for length, I'm so sure. And I want to just mention a few things about Marie. Uh, and game labor. Uh, this is Marie. Hi. Hi. Suddenly, I'm afraid I pronounced your name wrong. Marie. <laughs> Marie LeBlanc Flanagan. Did I do it right? Very okay. Very, very good. Yeah, but she's fine mm -hmm. if you call it wrong. <laughs> we just checked. Mm -hmm. And she's based everywhere, but recently she's mostly in Montreal and Toronto, Canada. And Marie made games, a lot of them before, and she made events, a lot of them before. And I know her from uh, her events earlier this year in Toronto. It's called Gaia, but also Toronto Game Week. So it's very, it's a bit like here. It's very homey, it's very close, intimate. And Marie is very caring. She cares about the world and the system she lives in, but also single human beings and other living things in it. That's partially maybe why you join the program to do surveys and interviews of um, the working condition of game workers. Uh, I received email, so I think it's not geographically specific to talk about our experience in the game industry, but to start with, the first phase at least is mostly in North America and also uh, Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. A little. Yeah, so um, that's the book. I, I think some of you work in the game industry, some of you are interested, and some of you may be in the tech industry or art industry, which have overlapping parts. Uh, with the content or the people who are covered in this book. So we discussed a little. First, I want to check, check about the language language issue. Is it, do you think English is fine or do you want bilingual? So maybe I just call bilingual stuff. If you need, you can raise your hand. So I'm not needed, as I know. And before so, that- So do you, who here speaks English? If you, speak, you understand yeah. what I'm saying right now. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone. And I, I know like Fiti has a, or any, Feng Jieping has a tradition to ask everyone who you are, if you feel okay to say something about yourself. Because we don't have a lot of people, which is great. We can be very connected. Mm -hmm. And it helps you be no more about you. And we can just pass this mic on, say anything uh, you identify yourself with, or you want to know who you are, or just random things. And you can make a lie too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe I'll give it to you first. Hello everyone, I'm Michelle and I'm working at a clinic as a pharmacist right now and I'm interested in the uh, some of the female issues so I joined the activity today. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Terence. I'm actually also Canadian. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I live here at my family's from Taiwan. Uh, I've just really like games all all my life, so as like it's it's a very cool storytelling medium, uh, the other media. But also, obviously, the games industry is a very complex place with a lot of um, because it's such a new sort of um, thing. So I'm just really interested in hearing yeah, more stuff about it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruta. I'm a journalist based in Taipei, and also I love video games and computer games since mm -hmm. I was a kid and I participate in the workshop this morning. Yeah, I'm really looking forward for the speech. Okay. Hi, I'm Jill, and I'm now work in, working in the game 
industry, I'm a comic art editor. So um, uh, I come with my friend. Ah, okay. Hi, I am Nori. Uh, I live in Taiwan and I am an indie game developer and a, a game artist, also a designer, a, a bit programmer. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. So because I work in the game industries and uh, there are many, many, many men and uh, little women, so I <laughs> can come here. Yeah, welcome. welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Hui An. So I'm, I'm from Taiwan, but at the moment I live in Germany. <laughs> and I'm a journalist with uh, Taiwan Fact Check Center. So we've been doing some fact checking stuff. Yeah, so uh, happy to be here. <sighs> Hi, I'm Marion. I'm working for the Goethe Institute in Seoul. I'm also very happy to be here. Uh, I'm David. I'm a nobody. Uh, because life is boring, so I, I like to play again. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Hi, my name is Luz, and I'm from California. And I'm actually here to support Tita, my mm -hmm. friend. But I found there's so many interesting uh, creators, so I decided to continue on and attend all of them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not actually in uh, any designing for Camry. I'm actually a mechanical designer that worked for a medical devices company. Okay. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Joyce and mm -hmm. I'm actually working in a game studio and we, um, the game studio called Team 9 and our first game is called Wenzi Yoshi and in English it's called Word Game. So. You can search on Steam, <laughs> whatever, it's a really cool game. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, w I am a like multiple roles in Team 9 right now. I am a business development, also a project manager. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you all, and I'm really glad and excited about the event today. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we're sharing a little things about ourselves, stuff you're comfortable with. Hello, everyone. I'm Amber. And I'm not actually in the uh, game industry, but I'm a user experience designer who designs for website or app, um, or other services. Okay. Yeah, so I'm interested in games personally. So I joined today's uh, event. Thank you. Yeah, great crowd. Yeah, great crowd. Okay. Um, and if anyone wants to take photos, it's very welcome. So you know, if you take photos, great. You can send them to me. Um, and we can jump in. Can we jump in? I think so. It is a, it's a delight to meet you all. And um, thank you for letting me speak in English. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge thing for me. <laughs> um, so welcome to, if you don't like the game, uh, change the rules. And I'd like to start with a question for you. Actually, I'd like you to start by drawing on the cover of your zine. So in your hand, you have a little piece of paper that's folded. And you just need to find the front. And you find the front by deciding what is the front. Okay, so that is, <laughs> that is up to you. Yeah, 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 find the front. Okay, and I want you to write on the front, uh, change the rules and your your own name. Um, so write, change the rules on the front. Okay, here I'll show you. Yeah. So, and then, yeah. Yeah, so change the rules and your own name. Just change the rules. Yeah. If you want to draw something, you can too. I'm gonna ask you a question while you write. Your name too, right? Yeah, your name, your name. Change the rules in your name. And then? Just your name, you just write your name on it. So so, so we know if it's lost, who it belongs to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a question for you. And this question is gonna be the first page of your zine too. But I wanna ask you and I want you to tell me first. So my first question is, what was your first job? What was the first job you did for money? Anyone wanna tell me? Dog sitter, okay, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Anyone else? Your first job. 
barista. Okay, yeah, fancy. That's a fancy first job. It's pretty good. Okay, yeah, part time. Anyone else? You wrote that was your first job. Well, I wrote something for them to, to ah. have a session there. They have to read something, and I provide something to read. That's, That's amazing. Yeah. Twenty. <laughs> okay, twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. Okay, who else? What was your first job? Waitress in coffee shop. Waitress. Sometimes coffee. coffee also, but not really barista. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not after <the> yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? First job. Has okay. so anyone not had a job? First of all, anyone here never had a job? That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, who else? First job. First job. Web designer. Web designer. Whoa. Yeah. That's impressive. First do for the family. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That counts. Yeah. Intern editor. Intern editor. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, the baby. Babysitter, yeah, yeah, babysitting's good. What about you? Cashier. Cashier? Oh, at a grocery store? Or? Okay, yeah, cool, yeah. And for you? Uh, I don't want to talk. Yeah, yeah you don't have to talk. <laughs> okay, that's the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. No one is, no one has to talk. You're allowed to not uh, be singled out. Um, so I'd like you to write on the inner page what your first job was, and you can draw something if you want to. Uh, on the first and yeah, just okay. inside, just just inside. So you did one page that was the cover, and now you'll do another little page inside. There's no way, wrong way of doing the zine. Okay. There's really no wrong way. You have some paper, and you have your beautiful marker. Yeah. Okay. And so, I know a little bit more now about who works in games, but I want to ask again, who here works in games? Can you put your hand if you work in games? Anyone else work in games, but you don't make money from it? No, okay. There's a huge industry of people making games and not making money, so I'm always curious. Um, yeah, first job. What do you mean? I don't, I don't want to know that yet. Who works in games? Okay, so, um, so work. Um, today we're here to talk about work. Uh, everyone here works. Yeah, we've established that. Yeah, work. All the work, all the time. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about work and also about games, which is, which is play. And for me, uh, I honestly believe that we can have a future where we have jobs that feel good, where we feel sustained, where we can feel treasured, where we can feel creative, where we can be supported. I believe that the way that we work now does not have to be the way that we work. There's nothing inevitable about our system, like the way that we work right now, it doesn't have to be this way. And most of the people I know are really struggling in their jobs and it, it really doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I'm a bit of a dreamer. <laughs> but who else believes that? Who else thinks we could have a different reality? Um, it doesn't have to be this way. Mixed crowd, mixed crowd. OK. People who think it does have to be this way, why, why do you think that? No pressure, again. It will be. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you, you think it's impossible to change? Sexism. Sexism, yeah. 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 I think that's right. I think we'll always struggle. Um, I'd, I'd like to stop for a second and talk about work and just introduce myself. Uh, so this is my name. <laughs> As Allison so perfectly said, Marie LeBlanc Flanagan. Um, and I make experimental video games in communities. I'll show you a bit about my context and what I do so you can get a feel for it. Uh, you can find me on social media that way. I'll be your friend. If you follow me online, I will be your friend. Um, <laughs> my background wasn't in games. I studied something called global studies with a focus on communities and identities. Um, so that was work. I ran a social enterprise doing alternative education with high-risk youth. I ran arts organizations. I ran something called, uh, uh, called Weird Canada. Uh, which was a music community about experimental music and scenes. Um, but all my work has been about the spaces between people. Does anyone know what I mean when I say that? The spaces between people. Yeah. I'm interested in like both the physical space between us and also like the intellectual and emotional space, like the ways that we connect with each other and the ways that we fail to connect. Uh, who here feels connected to your community in general? Like you feel really connected and held by the people around you? Oh, <laughs> we have we have two, we have three. Okay, good. Um, 
Like loneliness, loneliness is an epidemic. It's getting worse and worse. More and more people are feeling lonely and isolated, and this is something I'm interested in. And I carry it through games and through my other work with, with Weird Canada. Uh, we won the Best Music Website in Canada Award. I also do an event called Drone Day. Does anyone know what a, not the flying things, the music. Does anyone know what a sonic drone is? Is this the sound? Is this? It's any kind of like low extended or repeating tones. Um, so bagpipes have drones, electronic music has drones. Uh, but yeah, this is, so this is what I did, uh, drone day. So everyone always asks me, why did I start making experimental video games? Like that's a strange path. Um, and my path into experimental video games was basically into play. Uh, I, I played in the arcade when I was a kid, but I, what I love, what I'm passionate about is, is play. Um, and so I'd like to ask you now, to tell me something, and that is, when you were a kid, before you played video games, uh, before you played board games, when you played games that you made up with your friends, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You made up games. What was the game you played? Can someone tell me what what, what was the game you played? I can volunteer and so people have time to think. I have two cousins, and I forced them to play a game, a conductor, because um, when I was younger, there were still conductors on the bus. And I thought that's the coolest job. Like they have all the money and they're counting the mm -hmm. mathematics and they give you different tickets and it's very colorful. So I asked my cousin to play that game. I'm the, I'm the conductor, <laughs> but I only have two passengers so they have to come on, <laughs> on the bus and off and they have to tell me different stops. Sometimes they went it and I give them big, like we invented big money too. And we exchange monies and they have to play with me for an hour of that uh, for a long time. That is amazing, Allison. Yeah, conductor. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? I remember my first like play was with my little brother, mm. and then I like to play character like uh, roles playing games. So I was pretty, and I I actually set like a series of TV program, and then we were, okay chapter one we are gonna play with. I'm I'm I using the dolls. I play with the dolls, and mm. I force my brothers to play with another dolls. And we are like chatting, and then we have actions like, hey, you have to say this to me, and then I need to play. Yeah, and the whole, the whole home, the, the whole house is our playground. Like, I will run into the living room and then pretend to push, push the buttons like the elevator, and then running back to my rooms, and then to run to my brother say, hey, say something to me. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, a play a drama that yeah. I play with my brother. Yeah, you're like a playwright. You're yes. inventing the whole play in your whole house. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, anyone else remember a, or a game? What did you play? Mm -hmm. I always play with my sister, uh -huh. and we play some like very indoor games. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'm the owner of the bookshop, and I sell them books <laughs> to my sister. Yeah, I collect money for my the next bunk batch of socks of good books. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's just very like indoor activities. It's very realistic, your game that you had to sell. <laughs> it's really good. Anyone else want to share? No. It's okay, you can think about it. You can tell me later. Uh, I asked, I've asked this question all around the world, and I, it's my favorite question. There's nothing I love more than hearing people's childhood games. Um, what about you? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the games I used to play when I was a kid. This is really hard to explain. It's always hard to explain. You know how there's like a, when there's a creek and there's a road, you have to have like this round thing for the water to go through? I used to play a game in the round thing, just by myself with my cats, where I would just sing and stomp in the water and like go through the, the corn. <laughs> that was the game, that was just the game, just stomping and hearing my voice echoing uh, and singing to my cats. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really so. This is what I love. Everyone has their own their own games. Um, yeah. So so me, I was curious about play. I'm interested in games, but mostly I'm I'm curious about the spirit of play that people have when they're kids, and then when they get older, it kind of it often fades, uh, and that makes me very sad. And I think the video games that we have now are just a tiny fraction of what's possible. 
I think there's so many games that we haven't invented yet and so many types of play. Um, so yeah, this is the kind of play I was thinking about when I was a kid, uh, and I'm just curious about everyone else's. Um, so why did I start making games? Um, okay, so I think it was 2015, maybe around then, I was working. I was working running Weird Canada, which I told you about. Uh, it was a full-time job. Running Drone Day, which was also a full-time job. Also, I was working for the city on arts and culture, which was another full-time job. I would wake up every morning, <laughs> like 6 a.m., and I would start working, and I would work, 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 until, until I just went to bed at 3 a.m. And I was working all the time, and I hated it. And I was like, I need to have a different life. I need to change everything. Uh, so I moved to Berlin, as people do. They move somewhere far away. <laughs> I learned and I moved to Berlin and I thought, I'm going to learn how to make experimental video games. I didn't even know how to use a game controller properly. Uh, I didn't know how to code. I didn't know anything about game design. Nothing. Uh, yeah, I played games in the arcade. I played Tetris. And I thought, I'm just going to try. What's the worst that could happen? Um, so I reached out. I reached out to a school, uh, the School of Machines Making and Make Believe, which was an experimental school that taught people how to make art, code, code art. And I reached out to an experimental video games festival called Amaze in Berlin, and, uh, I, and, I, and I convinced both of these people to let me work with them. And that's how I learned. I just learned how to play games by playing them and learned how to make games by making them, uh, and it was like that. Uh, this was the first game I made. Uh, I made it using Open Frameworks, which is C++, which is not how someone should learn how to code, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> but I had a lot of support. Um, this game was very popular. People loved it. I kind of flew all over Europe and to South Africa, to Brazil. People wanted to play this game. It's very simple. It's just an infinite scroller, and you're trying to get the, the dots and trying to avoid the spikes. That's it. Um, but the catch is that the, you just have one playable character, and it is controlled by the space between your body and someone else's body. So, you know what? Nobody can make this. It's never down to one person. It's between two people, whether you win or lose. Siblings were amazing at this game. Couples were often terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're just, yeah, it's about, oh, oh no. I wonder if I can, yeah, thank you. Oh, beautiful assistance. Um, yeah, so you can see people playing it here. Um, yeah, you can see, you see them. They're, they're, they're doing great, these, these people. Um, yeah, so I mean, ultimately, this game is very simple, but uh, emotionally for me, it came out of these like deep feelings of disconnect from people, of like desire to connect with people. And my whole life, I found it so difficult. I mean, I can get to some point, and then I just can't quite get any further. And I don't understand why. And I thought, maybe the camera can teach me something about seeing. Like, maybe the camera can teach me about these spaces between us. Um, I also started making, I'm not going to talk too much about this, because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, but I started making games about like using bio signals, so like pulse, electrical conductivity, facial expressions to control sound. Again, I'm not, I'm gonna kind of like speed run through this because I made a game with smell. So I partnered with the Berlin uh, Smell Lab, which exists, uh, by the way. And I made a game that was like just about making decisions with your nose uh, because I, I noses are fascinating. I ultimately put the smells in balloons. I, at first I was hacking um, things that released the smells and then I found balloons were way more fun. Uh, yeah, uh, I made a VR game. This is a long time ago. Maybe I don't. I'm going to tell you about this one tomorrow. Uh, I'll tell you about this stuff tomorrow. Yeah, I made a, a game for an entire city of people to play, where you had to play. You had to meet up in real life, and then it was just like, all about like the ways that we care for each other in community, uh, based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, which we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, it was over a month. Basically, you either can like send the life force to your people, or you cannot. And if you don't, eventually people float away out into the void. Um, so. <laughs> It was about the way we care for each other in community. Uh, this one I made at the NYU Game Center. Again, oh, oh my God, sorry, I I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's too loud. Maybe, maybe, should, maybe we can mute it. Maybe if you just mute the entire computer. Yeah, so this one had two buttons. And basically, uh, if Allison presses her button, we go her way. If I press my button, we go my way. That's it. That's the whole game. When we're going Allison's way, Allison is losing all her rings to me, all her rings. If we go my way, I'm losing all my rings to Allison. <laughs> um, if anyone loses all their rings, we both die. 
So you're trying to balance the rings, you're trying to make sure you don't get... I thought, I thought I was making a game about the way that we have intimacy with our enemies. Like the way that we think about our, our nemesis all the time, what are they doing? But everyone told me this is actually a game about relationships. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, all this is some context. I'll tell you about this one tomorrow. This is the one with the sticker on my laptop. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you about that one tomorrow. Uh, right now I'm making a game inside a giant dome in Montreal. And so I'm thinking about how to how to like work with the space between people in like a sphere um yeah yeah getting kind of weird this one's here soft sanctuary i also make uh, community initiatives like the imaginary residency where artists get together and make space for each other to achieve things and uh and things like toronto games week uh which allison came to last year and gaia which is international video game curators coming together oh yeah nice yeah. I have stickers too if you want one. Um, uh, international video game curators coming together around the world. So if you become a curator or a games community organizer, reach out to me. We're going to Barcelona next. It hasn't been officially announced, but it's on tape now, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. So why are we here? We're here to talk about the comic. I just wanted to give you context so you know who I am, what I'm saying to you. Um, if you don't like that game, change the rules. Uh, so this was a research project. Believe it or not, the comic in your hands is business intelligence. Uh, it was, it was <laughs> based on a lot of interviews. Yeah, let me just scroll down to my notes and make sure I don't say anything awful. Um, should I say something awful? Uh, okay, so this was my first ever... Oh, no, I can't. I can't, actually. I promised. But this is my first ever comic. Um, I had never made a comic before. This is a theme in my life. I just make things that I don't know how to make. Uh, I drew it, I wrote it, and it's not just about nothing, it's a, it's a, it's a fictionalized version of real conversations. Um, and it was inspired by some of this work, oh so, sorry, I went forward a bit. It was inspired by some people who've done really interesting work like the Combi River Collective, uh, who did a lot of work talking about what the future of work could be and how that work should be for the benefit of the workers, not something that just bosses take. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, who we talked about before, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, which is very rare for a woman, very, very rare, for proving that, does anyone know what the tragedy of the commons is? Anyone heard of this? There's an idea put forward by this man with no proof um, that everyone believed, <laughs> um, that if you give people like a, b a bunch of land and some cows, the people will just have their cows eat all the grass until there's no grass left. Or if you give people a pool with some fish in it, the people will just eat all the fish until there's no fish left. Yeah, this is, water. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his idea is that people will just take, take, take until there's nothing left. Uh, and Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for proving actually, no, that's incorrect. Small communities are very good at organizing themselves and sustaining themselves in this way. Um, so he's wrong. Uh, <laughs> and also Joe Freeman, who talked about the tyranny of structurelessness. Does anyone know about that? Okay, this is so fun that I get to tell you about so many things. Um, tyranny of structurelessness is basically, so Jo Freeman was a, was a feminist and she noticed that in some feminist circles, sometimes they would have no rules, no rules at all. Just everyone does whatever they want. And you would think that would be very freeing, but what she was saying with, the, with this, which is a very short thing that you can read, is that when there's no rules at all, sometimes the existing power structures just get reinforced. So bad things happen and no one knows who to talk to about it. You don't know how to change things. Um, so that sometimes rules can be a really good, empowering, wonderful thing. So it came out of this. This is what it came out of. Um, and I convinced some people to give me money uh, for my business intelligence. And I, <laughs> I interviewed and surveyed 88 members of worker co-ops, which I'll tell you what those are, or we'll talk together about what they are. Very lucky number. Is it lucky? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> not in Germany. Not in Germany. Oh, yes. it's a... oh yeah, yeah, not in Germany. Okay. Yeah. There's a game about that. Uh, yeah, so I interviewed all these people. Uh, so co-ops, union people, experts, uh, and I, and, and devs with interesting perspectives on labor. They were mostly across Canada, but I also spoke to people around the world. And, uh, and we did a bunch of interviews and surveys. Uh, and and what, what do you think we've, we found in these interviews and surveys in the games industry? Yeah, they're not happy. Low pay. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is what we, yeah, 36, 36 interviews, 52 surveys. This is what we found. Uh, yeah, let's read it out loud, eh? Anyone want to tell me what it says? I won't, I won't look behind me. Burnout. Burnout. Yeah. 
Yeah, crunch. Do people know what crunch is? I heard in Taiwan people crunch. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Yeah. So crunch is like when you, you say, okay, we're getting close to the deadline. Let's forget that we're human beings with bodies. <laughs> Let's just work harder. Let's just skip dinner. Let's just order pizza. Let's work all night. Let's just, keep, so that's, that's crunch. Sometimes game workers crunch for months. Sometimes they crunch for years. Um, so salaries below living wage. What's the, what's the minimum wage here in Taiwan? By hour or by month? Uh, by hour. And is that is that enough? Is that enough? Like, can you get a nice apartment? Can you get a good? No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This, is what, <laughs> this is what I'm talking. Not enough. Yeah. This is what I'm talking. I'm talking about salaries below a living wage. Salaries so low that you can't afford to live. Um, creative freedom. People wanted to make the people who make games make often make games because they love them. They want to make games that matter to them. And people were making games that didn't matter to them, that like felt bad. Uh, job loss and precarity. So a lot of the times in the games industries we've talked about, the funding comes in in these cycles. So people get work for a while and then they get laid off. They get work for a while, they get laid off. Uh, so this kind of like cycles. And then identity-based harassment and bias. So sexism, racism, transphobia, these things happening in the industry. This is kind of depressing. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is worse. You know, it's worse. I don't know if you can read this. Every game you like is built on the backs of workers. Video game creators are burnt out and desperate for change. Rockstar responds to blowback over Red Dead Redemption's two teams, 100 hour work weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so I heard people talking about how in AAA people are burning out. Um, they're just burnt out and leaving. Obviously, this is not everyone. I heard people saying that it that a lot of a lot of people join the games industry out of passion and then they're taken advantage of because people are excited about games, games are cool, games are great, let's make games, and then and then people take advantage of that to give them like low wages and and uh, and crunch and crunch and crunching them. Yeah, this is a good quote. Uh, Whatever the intentions of our employer, or however good the conditions might be for the moment, we are in an industry that functions in a particular way to extract as much profit as possible from people. Um, so these were all from our interviews. Does any of this feel or sound familiar to people? Has anyone had these experiences? Everything. Can I see? <laughs> Everything? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, but hope, hope, right? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I brought hope, I promise. I'm not just gonna bring, I'm, I'm gonna bring some hope. What do we have? Okay, so first, I want to talk to you about co-ops. Does anyone know what a worker co-op is? Yes, it's teamwork. It's true. It's teamwork. Anyone else? The okay. Workers are the boss. Yeah. Workers are the boss. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a union. It's like okay. So and it's in the comic too. So you can have a cheat sheet. Um, this is a page from the comic. Uh, so. Basically, it's a business that's owned and controlled by the workers. So in different countries, it means different things. I don't know in Taiwan, you'll have to tell me. Uh, in every province in Canada, it's a little bit different. In every state in the States, it's a little bit different. But the idea is, in a worker co-op, if, if we're the workers, we also own the business. We own it, we control it. Now, that doesn't mean that we all get paid the same amount of money. Maybe we vote and say, Allison should get paid more because uh, Allison is like, digging in the dirt every night for eight hours or something. We, we, we decide. We decide. <laughs> the game we're making. <laughs> we decide. <laughs> yeah, some people think that in a co-op that everybody, like there's no CEO. Sometimes there's a CEO. You can vote on a CEO. But the point is, if, if we don't like the CEO, we vote them out. Uh, so that's what a worker co-op is. There's also principles and values that are shared around the world, but the main thing is that it's owned by the workers. How many people can there be in a co-op? Oh, so in Montreal, where I live right now, you have to have at least three people to start a co-op. 
but everywhere is different. You can have as many as you want. There's this region in Spain called like Mondragon, where it's just like hundreds, thousands of people doing all different kinds of co-op things. But this is a whole controversy too, is like how big can an organization get before you can't really vote anymore? Um, yeah, so this is this is from the surveys. Uh, so I would be open, this was, I would be open to, it, to joining a co-op. Yes, everybody. I would like to start found a co-op. No, not really. <laughs> Everyone's tired. <laughs> I believe that they can thrive. Yes, yeah, people think. I think they could solve some problems. Yeah, yeah, some people think. Um, okay, a little bit, a little pitch on co-op. So motivations is democratic, so you get to decide with people. There's less exploitation. You get some of the money, you know, money isn't going to the boss, and your job is more sustainable because you're part of it, you care. Uh, hesitations, people are afraid of co-ops for what reasons? You can cheat if you want. Why do you think people are scared of starting a co-op or joining one? Too many people. Yeah, too many people. Long meetings. Like if you're voting on everything, are we going to do meetings all day? You like can't yeah. make any decisions quickly. Yeah, you, you can't. Have to, like, if you want to add a feature, you have to like convene a meeting. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah, I gotta have a meeting for everything. These are myths. Like a co-op, for example, one of the. A called co-op, a co-op called co-op, they have a creative director. So the creative director makes all creative decisions. Now, if they're not making good creative decisions, they're going to get voted out. But the point is, is that you don't have to, you don't have to have long meetings. Um, yeah, and it's hard to find the right people. I mean, who here knows who you would start a co-op with? You had two friends. Does anyone know exactly who you choose? I choose myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know you either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's hard. It's hard. It's true. Uh, yeah, so advantages. Again, like you're going to care about working conditions. You, people can move away from some of these games that are, that are kind of like predatory games, games that are playing on people's uh, psychological weaknesses uh, to exploit them. Challenges. So real challenges, it is difficult. I don't know how it is in Taiwan, but like usually there's a lot of bureaucracy. It's the same as starting any business. Like it's hard. It's hard work. People find it overwhelming. There's like a tough adjustment period. Sometimes funding is hard. Uh, there's a lot of myths about co-ops and funding, but VC funding would be very hard. Uh, publisher funding is fine. You can get game publisher funding. If there are grants where you live, you can get those. But uh, yeah, VC funding is hard. Because, because VC, do people know what VC funding is? Is this familiar? Venture capital. Like the point is they put money in because they want to get a lot of money out. And a co-op, like no, because the money's going to you. So you're not going to give someone else that much control or that much money. Uh, okay, but we can't all have co-ops because uh, because we can't because it's hard. It's a really like big thing to start a new business. So another another topic we talk about in the in the comic is unions. Does anyone know what a union is? I'm not gonna. I promise I won't make you define it. But do you know what it is, kind of roughly? Yeah, a couple hands, a little bit of a little bit of nods. Uh, unions are different in different countries, but um, essentially. The idea of a union is you're working with your co-workers to negotiate for what you want. Are people here employed in businesses? Like, do you have bosses? Who is a boss? A few, but not too many bosses. Not too many bosses. I'm my own boss. It's exhausting. I'm not a good boss. Um, yeah, so the idea with a union is, is like, you have a boss and you have the workers. The boss has a lot of power. A lot of power. And sometimes it's nice if you can talk to your coworkers and make a plan and say, okay, we want more money. And if you all together go to the boss and say, we want more money, it's a lot harder for the boss to say no. So that's the idea of a union. But a union is like often a legally recognized thing. So again, someone who knows can tell me in Taiwan how it works. But in Canada, like you, 50% of the workers say, we want to start a union. They, they sign the papers, they, go, they sign the cards and they send it in. Now the boss, it's very difficult for the boss to fire them because they've unionized, they have legal protections. Um, so a union is going in this legal direction to work with your coworkers, but it doesn't even have to be legal. It can just be talking to your coworkers and saying, we deserve to have bathroom breaks. We don't want to crunch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so union motivation. So people start unions because they have bad working conditions again. Uh, how are people's working conditions? Actually, let's stop and do a page in the scene. I would like to stop do a page in the scene. You've done two so far. What I'd like you to tell me about is a time at your work where you felt disrespected by your boss, where you felt like your boss really was not treating you well. 
Maybe they didn't pay you on time. Maybe they talked down to you. Maybe they made you do something that was not in your job description. Start us off and share. It was plenty. <laughs> you have so many stories. The whole rest of it could be. It, but people are drawing. Should I interrupt? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, right. Uh, I quit that job. <laughs> it was 2013. I remember it. I was uh, working in a famous publisher, like book publisher. There are our books here. I I did some books here, and it was a really famous publisher. So everyone wants to work for it. When people know I work in it, they are very, sometimes even jealous. But the thing is, it's a very special place because our leader, the director, is a charismatic leader. So everything is dependent on her mood. And she has favorites, um, people who listen to her usually. And there's a way she does things, it's like gaslighting. She does. She doesn't tell you you're not good enough, but you're always compared with other people you know. At least something you're doing are as good or even better, but the way she organizes things is called criticize and self-criticize. And that was my first job. I was, now you know my age. I was really young, so I thought maybe they're right because they are established names in the industry. And I remember there are times I, I was sitting in the staircases and crying because I want to be good. And I tried and I thought I am good, but I was repeatedly told I'm not. And it was for two years. I'm, I like the work. I just hate the people. <laughs> yeah. uh, some of them, not all of them. And when I quit, I never remember this. My direct supervisor took me to lunch. That's a tradition. I, I resigned. I didn't get fired, so I still get a lunch. And she told me, she always talked to me the way she talks to her four-year-old son, and which is loving in a way, but also, you know. And she said, Allison, um, you will never get a job <laughs> again anywhere because you're nice, but you're too childish. We've created the best for you. And there are this coworker who's really concerned about you. She report on your activities every day. <laughs> you did this thing wrong, that thing wrong, and this thing wrong. Yeah, and I just, because I quit, so I felt really powerful. I said, oh, I quit partially because I don't want to be co-workers are these people. They humiliate me, and I paid for the lunch. <laughs> I don't know why I have to pay for it. And when I signed it, I felt really good. I said, never mind, I'll cover this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was very bad. Does anyone yeah. else want to share a bad, bad boss? Bad boss moment? Oh, yeah. Um, I... I mean, it has to be the pandemic. I This was when I was in coursework for my PhD. So I was a student, but I was also an employee. And my employment was conditional on remaining in, in classes. And it was in the middle of Omicron. So we, were, we should have been at home. And uh, they made us go back to class. And I said, I, I walked into class and had a panic attack um, and I left and I went home and I emailed my professor and I said I'm not comfortable with this we're not we shouldn't be in class you know and he said and he was like he was he's like famous well known for being like a pretty rad professor or having that kind of reputation of being you know inclusive and doing radical progressive work and he emailed me back and told me that we had to learn to live with a pandemic. And I thought, like, you, 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 your career is built on being a radical person. <laughs> and you're saying this to me unironically, like this is a meme, it's a joke, to live with a pandemic. You know, what that means is that a lot of us are gonna die of the pandemic or yeah. be disabled, you know? Um, yeah, I never forgot that one. Anyone else? 
Doesn't have to be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have a boss talk down to them? Just kind of say, just talk to them like they're a child, like Allison's boss. No, no, no. Woo, that's nice. <laughs> what about us to work longer than you're being paid for? No. Uh, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've had some pretty good bosses, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you had good bosses? We are traumatized. You're traumatized. <laughs> yeah. Put it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you put it somewhere else. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've had some bad, bad, bad bosses. Uh, definitely bad bosses. I've had bosses who sexually harassed me. Um, has anyone had that? You don't have to tell me, but yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, I've had bosses that sexually harassed me, tried to date me. Which is not appropriate, honestly, in a workplace, I think, ever. Uh, what else? Yeah, but, well, I had this one boss. So when we went to work, well, we had to go 15 minutes early to this job. And the computers would round up 15 minutes. So you had to be there 15 minutes early and it would just round up. So you wouldn't get paid for that. And then when you left, they would round down to the 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is small, but ultimately is like feels very illegal. Yeah, just like up and down. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else my other bad boss. I mean, there's just too many. I've, I've, but like it's complicated, you know, because also sometimes you love your butt with sometimes they're great mentors. It's like a complicated relationship. It's not always like they're bad or they're good. Um, but it's an unequal power relationship, essentially is what I'm trying to say. Um, and a lot of people have like informal co-ops or collectives. They're like, it's a collective. But ultimately, if there's one person who can say, this is my ball, I'm going home, you can't play baseball anymore, or whatever, I don't play sports, I'm sorry if that was a bad one, but <laughs> this is my console, I'm taking it home, you can't play the video game anymore, then you have an unequal power relationship. And this is my pitch for unions, and I'm not saying unions are perfect, but I do think that we should have control over our own work. Um, so yeah, little pitch on unions. Uh, so yeah, people are inspired to start unions because they don't like their jobs. They're just not feeling good about it and they want they want to work in their job. They want to work in their industry. They even want to work with their boss, but they just want more control. Uh, so hesitations, when I was interviewing people, a lot of people said, especially in indie, small indie studios, they're like, yeah, we love unions, they're good, but do we need them? Like maybe we don't need them, other people do. It's not as bad as AAA here. Maybe I'll just switch jobs if it's not good. Um, so the people that were starting unions, this is what they were asking for. Here, I'm going to go ahead in my slides so I don't have to keep turning back. It's a very, it's a very gentle list. Like this is what people want. They want livable wages so you can afford an apartment and your groceries. And <laughs> okay. They want to work from home, especially if they're sick uh, with COVID or something. They want first right of refusal. So if they get laid off from their job and then the funding comes in, they want to get rehired for the job. So that's it. Like if, if the funding comes back. People wanted benefits, so they wanted health care, they wanted to be taken care of. They wanted sick leave uh, when they're sick, less micromanagement, so trust that they can do their job well. Uh, a lot of people said their bosses just didn't trust them. Um, equitable treatment, so to be treated, if you're a marginalized worker, so if you're queer, if you're racialized, if you're trans, if you're a woman, like just being treated as well as everyone around you essentially, uh, and defined job descriptions. So if your job is a uh, programmer, you're not also taking out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> or if you are, it's in your job description. It's not like a surprise. This is also your job now. Uh, so yeah, this is what the unions were asking for. Not too much, I think. Um, but people often don't start unions because they're afraid of getting laid off, which is real. It happens. Sometimes bosses say, I don't want to deal with this. They close the company. Uh, they're afraid of like talking to their coworkers because it can be very secretive, and they're afraid of getting blocked, like not getting jobs in the industry uh, because they they're known as troublemakers. This was funny. This is a funny thing from the survey. So, who would support a unionization effort at their workplace? Most people, slightly more than half. I'm interested in starting a union at the workplace. Almost no one. <laughs> I believe that unions can thrive in the game industry. Almost everyone. Um, so I don't know, everyone kind of is interested, but no one wants to start them because it's scary. Oh, I yeah. see. Oh, yeah. There you go.
Thank you. I, I saw your faces. <laughs> yeah, so that's a little bit of a pitch of co-ops and unions. Someone else says to raise the union. Oh, no, Johnny. Okay, I see a little typo in there. Yeah, yeah, people want um, someone else to start it. Yeah. So that brings me to what's next. Uh, okay, so I told you about co-ops. Co-ops being businesses that people start, video game studios in our case. You start it with your friends, you control it together, you own it together, legally. Unions, where maybe you have a boss, but you band together with your coworkers to have more rights. Um, but I don't know, I'm curious if there's things we haven't even imagined yet. Uh, we live right now in this way, we live in capitalism, things are the way they are. There are bosses, there are companies. I guess I, I'm curious to know, and, and this is why I started this research, because I'm fascinated with game designers. I'm a game designer. Game designers are really interesting people. They're people who are thinking about systems all the time, and they're thinking about what's possible. What could happen? And so I was curious, like, what could game designers imagine? Like, what if game designers were imagining work from scratch? What would that look like? What would jobs look like? How would we divide work? Um, and so this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested, that's why I'm here. So you can tell me what is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell me. Anyone else want to answer that before I jump in? No? Anyone? There are absolutely lots of cooperative games, but people tend to reproduce what exists. I feel like there's a lot of reproduction. When I was a kid, one of my favorite board games was called um, Harvest Time. And the idea was that winter was coming, so you had to get the crops in. And it was cooperative. Oh, and now winter's, spring's coming. Oh no, now we have to plant the crops together. And it was all about like cycles, cycles of, of behavior and how we could work together to make things happen. Um, Another example, yeah. but it's not game, it's art. Yeah. I, I have the privilege of Michael use usage. Um, it's this artist, he's like a Robin Hood of capitalism. Um, he, what he does is conceptual art and performance art of uh, very sensitive issues like environmental rights. Mm -hmm. And the way he does it is he's really good at manipulating media in a good way. And he is very good at uh, creating visual spectacles. Like uh, he was doing something about water getting really polluted. Mm -hmm. And he, he just made really big visual from high above because the water is red. That's how bad it is. And they put some fish in it. And he said, let's all go here and eat hot pot. Then it becomes viral. <laughs> and of course, people are supporting him, not only because it's fun, but also because it's crucial. And he's helping people who live near that water. And always he gets support from these people because he's also dangerous. He doesn't want to be caught uh, by police. This happened in China. And then what he does is he has all these WeChat groups or signal groups and people will uh, give him information, host him at homes, and uh, sometimes protecting him. And this makes no money, but it's so meaningful. And sometimes it pushes because the viral media helped him, like the government or the corporate has to face this problem, but he doesn't make any money from it. Somehow he's also famous in art world, and it, but he doesn't do exhibition or sign a gallery. What he does is he go to this creative cultural district or whatever that's owned by a government or a really rich, like Foxycom or something, and he would propose something really silly and write a very big budget. I need a million to make something, and this money is nothing for these companies, and they just give it and he used like maybe 1% of that money and hire someone to do something really silly, but um, as impressive as it is to the corporate head. And then he can save the other part to continue to fund himself. Yeah, it's, I think it's like a Robin Hood story. Uh, yeah. his, name? his name is Nut Brothers. It's one person, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. Hmm. Anyone else, anyone have an imagining? Can you imagine something different? Oh, let's do a page in a zine. <laughs> I'd like you to imagine, I'd like you to do a page in a zine that is about what you wish your work was like. What would it be like? You can just write down some words. Um, like, is it, you can also draw. What about for you? What is your, what is your dream work like? 
Yeah. 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 You have it. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about your work? Uh, I can work with people I respect. Mm. Uh, but I have this thing I was asking people. I, I'm very. It's very easy for me to like what I do. <laughs> There's nothing I made or I have my hand touched on. I hate it. I don't know if it's a good thing or maybe it's a, like a. What's the word? I send M to them. The M part in this. Mm. Sadoistic and the oh, other. masochism. Yeah. 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 But it's very easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you ask the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> so no work. Uh, I'm sort of anti-work, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but I would still make games probably. Yeah. 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 I, I did a thing with some artist friends last year called No Working, mm -hmm. which was just like co-working, except the whole plan was we would do no work in the time together. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't figure it out. I tried so hard. I was like, I'm going to go for a walk. And then I was like, I kind of feel like I'm exercising, which kind of feels like work. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to call a friend. And then I was like, oh, this is a little bit like reinforcing my social connections, which feels like just un unpaid work. Mm. And then I thought, <clears throat> I was looking at these bees that were, I don't know, in the flowers. And I was like, hmm, I could make a bee game. I love bees. And I was like, no, stop. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to not work. Like, I do a lot of work that's unpaid work. But then I was like, what is not work? Um, yeah. But I mean, yeah. I think it's hard because, like, productivity shouldn't be connected to capitalism you mm. know you know what i mean like i i sew my own clothes for example and it's mm. it's it's pathological i just i get a lot of fabric and then some days i the the diet the desire like it bubbles up in me and i have to l listen to music and my headphones all day and just make clothes yeah. and sometimes i don't wear the clothes ever <laughs> or they just go in my closet i make them and i think that doesn't look very good and then i like rip them up or something but the it is productive, you know, yeah. it's, you are, pr I'm producing something, but the mm. thing I'm producing is not capitalist. And people sometimes ask me when they like my outfit or something, if I sell my clothes ever, and they say, I would buy it, as if it's a compliment, right? Mm. I would buy yeah. it though. Yeah. I say, I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe if, you, if we're friends, I might make you a piece of clothing yeah. as a gift, or as yeah. a gift that expects a response, the way yeah. the gifts expect responses, right? Yeah. But not, why, but, you know. Why did you refuse? Because if I, if I sell it to people, then it's capitalist productivity. And I don't want it to be capitalist productivity. I want it to be productivity, pathological productivity from <laughs> me, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. How do you survive? <laughs> hmm? How do you survive then as well? I mean, what, what is your job? Who pays you? Oh, I'm a PhD student. Okay, so you're university. university. Hmm. Yeah. It's your thoughts rather than. No, sure. Uh, he works as teaching assistant. Yeah, it's my. It's more important than my thoughts is my greetings. <laughs> 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 but not your clothes, mate. No, absolutely not. I have a sad story that I. Didn't happen to me. I'm lucky. I have this friend. Uh, she's from Hong Kong. She's immigrating to Canada. And she. Uh, I don't know the policy, but she needs a job. So she can stay there for the first one year or two years. And she got this job. I told you it's an overseas education consultation company. So basically, he helps pe she helps people to polish their resumes so that these people can apply for Ivy League schools. And she hates her job because her real thing is to do writing. And she does on the side. And there's no time for her to do it. But she has so many meetings with the company and um, looking at all the resumes of the young kids, she said, uh, these are the kids that you don't want to be friend with. You feel, <laughs> you feel sad for them, but you also hate them. And But the thing I want to share is that I told Galen before, uh, my friend is really good at anything she does, and she has this good student's mentality. So <coughs> although she hates this job so much, she somehow does it really well. And she's promoted <laughs> and got more responsibility. She has to manage other people. 
to do the job and she hates herself more. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. she really needs this job to stay in Canada, so yeah. Yeah. There's a real danger, you know, getting promoted. You yeah. know, when you're when you're good at it. <laughs> yeah. I had a job once just like picking up beer bottles in a bar. Like it was a music venue and I just had to pick up the beer bottles. And uh, I like I love working. That's one of my problems. I'm yeah, I I was just like, I love this, it was so fun. I was just like running, 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 picking up the bottles. And my coworker was like, Marie, please stop. Stop. They're like, I've worked so long and so hard to make this a chill job where you can just lay around for hours and you're making it worse. You gotta stop. And so I did. It was very hard for me. I went and did something else. I think like I would like go and draw for hours or whatever, something read. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there's something about work. Uh, does anyone want to share something about your dream job? One word. One word. I'm always looking for a job that is, has a, a, an idea a little bit naive, but I'm looking for a job that is being positive to the world and also I the things I'm, I like and I'm good at. So that is my dream and um, yeah, I think that is my dream job. I feel like that's a very reasonable ask, mm -hmm. you know? That's not too much to ask. Yeah, and yeah. I want to have some a game some emotional aspect rather mm -hmm. than getting wage or something mm -hmm. from my daily work. Yeah. Anyone else want to share something? Yeah. Um, so I always wanted to help people, like go to like third world country and help people with building bridges and passing out food to them, that kind of thing. But when I started working for this company, it's a medical device company, so when I joined the company, they were, they were like, oh, we're helping people, because you know, what we do matters, because um, we're saving people. But then in the end, after working for eight years, I still really hate doing it. <laughs> and although it, it does seem like the mentality that they've been telling you that, oh yeah, you're helping people, you're helping people, but. I'm still not enjoy doing it, mm -hmm. and I rather like, you know, start an organization, gather some money, and go to third world country, and then you know, helping, uh, building bridges for students and schools and all that. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to share your dream job? Anything about your dream job? Yeah. Okay, so, um, this one came from my first job, and at the time I was really under a lot of pressure, but. At the same time, I didn't feel like my manager or my boss um, realized that I have some, some kind of men problems. Like I have some depression at the time. When I realized I have a really serious problems, came up to my mind when I go to work. I was like, oh, I, I don't, I want to disappear. I don't want to go to work. And then I realized I was sick. But what up, um, getting me upset was my boss or my manager didn't realize this and they just asked me oh are you okay okay we just give you like one week to think about wh what we are thinking about but i think this time is not enough for me to figure out what happened to me so after this experience i realized that if a company really cares about employees mental health that will be my dream job or something i think mental health should be seen as important <coughs> as physical health as well yeah. yes that's that's my dream job or maybe i will create this kind of um working environment in the future maybe yeah yeah that's it i i think uh, because i really like to read a detective novel so i would i think my dream job is like to become a novelist for detective book yeah but to be honest, like actually, I think uh, around four years ago, I had kind of the chance to to pursue this because I just left the comp uh, my my job, and I kind of have time to really like do this because before that I was just really too busy at work and didn't really have time for that. But once I have time, I just I feel I don't really I didn't really have like good ideas like to write. And and then yeah, and then suddenly and then just got very frustrated like feel like oh my god I need I really need something like I can, I need to make money. So then I switched to like I become a freelance writer. 
I start to write article for maybe some other magazine or some media and stuff. And then at one point I just stopped doing that and then I tried to also get, get a full-time job at some other company. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I would say like for now I think it's still my dream job like to write detective novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Can't wait to read them. Yeah, dream job. Sure. Uh, this is very topical, but I, I do want to uh, make games. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's it's just something that, like, I think I put off a very long time, like thinking about because I was always like, oh, I'll, um, you know, this is like job. You know, the game market's hard. Mm -hmm. Making games is hard. It's it's a very multimedia sort of thing. Um, and then I was like, you know, I'll, I'll find like, do stable work first and do later. And then, and then one time in my office, I was just like, I really want to create. <laughs> um, I, I really want to like tell stories and, and um, uh, do stuff like that. And I, it's, it's still like a, I mean, I'm, I'm still doing work that's not that. Um, but it's like a slow process of like, you know, like, oh, well, everyone's, you know, the world is only like going on, right? It's like, mm -hmm. If there's any time to to do what you want to do, it's like slowly work at it and yeah, you know, still experiment. <laughs> That's really good because it brings me to my next question. That mm -hmm. that was perfect, um, which is for your next page in your zine. Um, I want to know what's standing in your way. What's blocking you? And it, yeah, what's blocking you from your dream job right now? Like, is it is it money? Is it resources? Is it um, yeah? What is it? Is it that it's no job? <laughs> so, yeah, what's blocking you? Yeah, yeah, there's no conductor. What's blocking? What's blocking you? Why can't you have your dream job? <laughs> I love you giggling in the back. Yeah, I think it's about surviving in this society. Yeah, surviving in this society. Everyone can write that. No, you should, you should write your own, you should write your own thing. <laughs> no, but it's true. Like, how do we pay rent, you know? How do we, how do we eat? Yeah. Um, I do think it's always like a, a balance. It's a compromise. It's you have to decide for yourself what kind of priorities you have. I mean, for example, for me, it's incredibly important, you know, to have to be surrounded. I mean, I like the the sentence you said about with people I respect and um, where we have really a creative and inspiring environment and also of not being worried about money. So I need to like to have some safe, um, yeah, safe as a blanket or something like a square I can be creative in or I can work <coughs> in. Is it perfect? No, not at all. But I mean, I think that that is the square I need to navigate and that's the decision I need to make. So I think it's n very nice to dream about the, mm. the dream job or whatever, but I mean, there needs to be a connection to realism mm. and what holds me back or what kind of pri priorities I set. So I think when I think of, thought about before what, what's my dream job, I think for me, it's like being inspired by the people I'm surrounded with and being safe with money. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyone blocked on writing while you're blocked? Oh, <laughs> mm. 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 I, 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 okay, mm. <laughs> I can contribute something mm. and give you more time to think. Uh, I have two dream job actually, but I. Because I, my job is really good now. I, I like what I do. I forgot about them. One is maybe that's a common uh, scenario for everyone. I want to be a librarian for a long time. I really think that was Japanese story love letter. Uh, the protagonist uh, is a librarian. I think that's the most romantic job ever. And But the thing is, I realized like in Hong Kong, US, maybe Germany, Canada too, if you want to be a librarian, you first have to pay for education and to get a degree and then you can become a librarian. And most of the librarians I know don't like their job because they're overworked. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and the second job is, because I was, uh, when I was little, oh, in my life, I'm very talkative. 
and I was invited to children's show and talk. I really like the adults who are hired by the radio stations. They don't even wash their face. <laughs> you don't need to. And they're doing it really well. But now it's all podcast is gone. And podcasters don't make money, money. Don't make enough money, but there's so many free contents. So that, that dream is gone too. But I think it's also very typical, like content makers. It's free and easier to make contents, but it's more difficult to survive. Yeah. 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 Yeah, completely. And then there's people telling us that AI is taking our jobs and I don't like it's like, please do take our jobs and just leave us the money, you know? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it won't happen like that unless we do something. But it could. It could happen like that, is what I'm trying to say. AI doesn't have the money. Yeah, yeah, AI doesn't need the money. AI doesn't have the money. The money goes to Elon Musk. Yeah, that's true. Did everyone get a block? Anyone want to share a block? Blocked? I see people blocked on blocked. I mean, it really is. Like, often it's, often it's like, okay, well, how would I survive? Or how do I have the energy to even like make any kind of shift out of this world right now? It's so hard. Um, if you're already rich, it's like, am I good enough? Actually, even poor people, like imposter syndrome, that's a real thing. Uh, what is even the first step to the thing I want to do? I'm trying to help you in case you're blocked on your blocks. Um, yeah, because like, I don't know what my dream job is. Like, I feel like I keep doing my dream. Whatever my dream job is, I go and do it. And then I'm like, oh, this is hard. <laughs> Like I thought, oh, I'm going to start an experimental school. And then I went and worked with that school. And I was like, oh, this is mostly emails and, and like social media posts. I don't want to do that. I make games. It's pretty fun. But mostly it's like crying while I try and code, you know? Um, <laughs> or like not having enough time to like get something done in the way that I'm dreaming. Like I'm, I'm making it sound bad. It's also great. But I feel like whatever job I get, I think, oh, maybe fulfillment doesn't come from work. Um, yeah, but I do love it. I'm gonna keep. Work. I'll probably work until I die. Like I just love love working. Um, like this, like this. I I drew this in about three months. My, by the end, my hand like I was just like, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Dream dream jobs. When I think about my dream job, it's like really. I think similar to what you were like surrounded by people that I feel supported and inspired by, um, doing work that feels like it matters somehow, whatever matters is, whatever meaningful is. Um, and when I imagine like what is blocking me, oh, it seems insurmountable. Like how do I get from here to there? I mean, I am surrounded by incredible inspiring people, but we're all drowning, you know? We're all like, okay, how do we pay rent? Which I'm like doing pretty good on that front right now, but it's like tomorrow AI could take my job, who knows? <laughs> Yeah. How many pages do you have? Oh, I see a question back there. No, it's just about because this AI topic is coming up. I think if really AI is taking over our jobs, <coughs> there need to be someone asking the right questions, mm -hmm. demanding the right things in a way so that mm -hmm. AI can respond. And I mean, we all know how difficult it is uh, as a designer or as a writer to really meet this demand. Mm -hmm. And I think. We don't need to worry about that too much, I think. I mean, it will be mm. like the very simple test, but in terms of creativity, I I mean, I think if we band together, we have nothing to worry about. I think if we bent, if we, yeah, I mean, like, is AI going to get good at doing stuff? Maybe, maybe not. But I, I feel like what we need is to be together in this. It's kind of back to the union topic. It's saying, OK, no, we don't want that. We want. We want it when we're sick, we want to be taken care of. And we want to be able to pay our rent and not live in a horrible place either. We want a nice place, you know? <laughs> Good lights, you know? And like it's either hot or cool depending on what we want. Um, I think we're down to two pages in the zine, is that right? Yeah, in the back, in the back. And we're down to 10. Yeah, 10. Yeah, with 30 minutes left? Yeah. That is a lot of talking. How are people doing? Are you tired? I would be so tired <laughs> listening to someone talk this long. Yeah. Um, let's do our let's do our last two pages, and then we'll just mill about, and people can leave or, or chat or ask questions or whatever you want. Okay. So for the last two pages, one of them is going to be a test page. I'm going to ask you to write down what a co-op is. <laughs> <laughs> what is a co-op? 
real. For real. I'm not kidding. I'm not because I want you to leave here with this, like with it, because I feel like it's hard. The first couple times I did, did these conversations, I mean, I did one in Mexico, I did one in Halifax. I was just talking like big, huge ideas, and then people were like, "Wait, what is a co-op, Marie? You know, what is a co-op? A co-op is uh, is a business that's owned and controlled by the workers." Yeah, well, I'm happy to give the answer. I'll give you the answer a hundred times, but it's like the point is, is that you own it and you control it. That's what it is. It's the ownership and the control. Uh, and many other, there's the co-op values. I mean, you can read your comic. It's all there, but um, yeah, <laughs> own and control. And then underneath that, what is the union? That's a lot harder. Honestly, that's a lot harder. What is a union? I'm still learning things about what is a union, but uh, a union is when the workers band together. The workers band together to get their needs met, to get what they need. The workers come together. That's what a union is, and usually it is like a legal status. But I mean, ultimately, it's the workers coming together. Yeah, it's good. You're gonna leave here, and you're gonna know what a co-op is. Yeah. Okay, and then we still have the back page, but the next page I want to do. Earlier on in this in this conversation, we talked about your early memory of play, and we didn't write it down, but I want you to write it down now because I think. We didn't write it down, right? No. Okay, good. I want you to write it down now because honestly, I, I don't really see a difference between work and play. Like in my imaginary world, uh, the kind of playful things that you were doing when you were a kid are what you could be doing as an adult. It could be that joyful. Um, so I want you to write down that early play thing that you did, that early game. Or you can draw it. Okay. Okay, and if you have a back page left, and I know some of you might not have back pages left because um, everyone has their own creative way of making these books, but you'll find some space somewhere. I just want you to make a little symbol. I want you to draw a little symbol and. Uh, the symbol should be your, I just want it to be like your commitment to yourself. You're a human being. You know what I'm saying? Like, and even if you were an animal, like you're a being and you deserve respect. And I want you to make a symbol that, that reminds you of that. That like whatever job you have, like you should be respected, you should be trusted, you should be paid a living wage. <laughs> and, that, and that you deserve that. Um, and that it's like absolutely absurd that we live in a world where that doesn't happen. Like it is, it is Unacceptable. Uh, so, yeah, whatever the symbol is for you. Maybe it's a heart or a star or a circle. Maybe it's a character. Like in the futures, I imagine people will look back on us now and say, What? How is this ever acceptable? This is totally bad. This is inappropriate. No way. No way, no way. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. And while the world was burning, too. Yeah, while the world was burning. Yeah, as in the comic. They're like, the world is burning. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Yeah. <laughs> Why? It makes no sense. Yeah. Maybe that's my dream job, is dinosaur. Dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice long neck and eat them. So good. Or cockroach, really? Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They're pretty invincible, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and I'd love to take a picture. I promised I would take pictures. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how we can do this. Selfie. A self, you just, you've seen how bad I am at selfies. I always like get myself out of them. Maybe I could do it on a timer or something. Let's see if this would work. Let's see if that would. No, that's not. See, I haven't even, I haven't even turned the selfie setting on. What about that? No, no, no good. What about like this? What's that? It's not very good though. Should we get a two people? Should we get a random person off the street to take a photo for us? Here, can we pull these forward? Can we pull these forward with me? I can't take a picture. No, but I want you to be in the picture. Would, would you be open to taking a photo for us? Okay. Oh, I can't. I don't want to be in the photo. Why do you want to be in the photo? I, I just look better. I can put, you look amazing. I can Photoshop myself in it. Okay. <laughs> I like doing that. You should be in the picture. Because I missed all my graduation stuff, ceremony, and, and I do it all the time. So we're gonna do a photo. Is this a good yeah? Are we? And with yeah. the comics, if you can, because then I'll. Hell yeah. For reasons that I cannot disclose to you, it's fun for me to have the comics. It's good. That's okay. scary. Yeah. One, two. No, no, Albert, no, we're not, we're not ready. We're not ready. Oh. You got comics? Okay, we got we got faces. What kind of face should we? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, e, one. One, two, two. three. E, er, san. Eyes wide high. That's all the languages I know. Thank <laughs> you. Um, that's yours, right? Yeah, that's mine. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And so I'll be here. We can have conversations. We can talk. Uh, oh yeah, I can give you my. This is. This is all the thanks. We can talk about who to thank. It's also in the back of the comic. That goes to Instagram, but I'm kind of on every social media. So you can email me. You can text me. I will respond. No, it's not secret. I can share them with you. Yeah, no problem. Um, happy to share. Really happy to talk to you about your dream jobs. You can email me. I would love to. I would love to see you in your dream job. Uh, yeah. Do you have one secret how you inspire yourself? I mean, in terms of game making. Ah. I mean, these were all teasers. What you did. Teasers of my. Yeah, it sounds so interesting. Okay, all my games. <laughs> All my games come out of pain. They all come out of like loneliness, alienation, feelings of just feeling like lost in the world and being like, how do I connect with people? How do I find like the peace I'm looking for? All my games, yeah, all my games so far have come out of some kind of pain. And it's like, uh, it's amazing. Cause you take the pain and then you just crunch it down and then it turns into something. That's like a broken alt control game, and uh, yeah, no, it's a. Uh, I feel like this is art. Art is this. This is what my mom said to me anyway. My mom, who also read this comic and said, "Marie, this is just all these characters are just you." Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my co-researcher for the white paper said, "This is just every single person we interviewed, everything that they said." So, I mean, I guess we're all the same. But yeah, my mom. My mom said, "I'm worried." She said, "I'm worried about you, Marie." When I was when I was maybe six years old, because she said. I feel like your entire life, the amount of art you make is going to be exactly equal to the amount of pain you have, because I think it just 100% comes out of pain. When and my mom is very dark when sometimes. Six. When you were six? I was a very dark six-year-old, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was like crying about, I don't know, something. A war, probably war. <laughs> but yeah, no, it comes, out of, it comes out of pain. It also, I feel like there's like a motor inside me that never stops. Like I am consumed with energy for things. Um, so. Say something positive about oh. Marie. Yeah, I have this compulsory thing. Like, I want to be positive. Yeah. Um, is Marie arrived in Taipei at five thirty on Monday, and a.m. 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 So I want to, cause I arrived early. I have a hotel room, so our original plan is when she arrives, she can go to my room. That didn't work out with with you either. But she can sleep a little, put the stuff there, and then I have a set alarm to wake myself up. So that I can receive you, 
But so I wake up at 5.30, but then I get a message, it's like, I'm so energetic. That's true. I don't need to sleep. I'm going to hike or in hot spring. And that's true, <laughs> I said, that's oh, true. at least maybe you can have breakfast together. I was worried, you know, it's she, the first time she's been in Asia. In Taiwan, yeah, first time. It was so early when we went to the restaurant, it wasn't open. <laughs> but it happened again several times, and then we have this Discord channel of the people in our program. Marie shares the photo like she's been here for a year. <laughs> <laughs> this morning she was in the house praying. Yes, yes, true. Yeah, and, then and tonight, yeah. everyone, we're going to a queer dance party. <laughs> See? So you're all invited. Uh, jellyfish, is that something nine? I'm going for hot pots. So oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go for hot pots too, and then I'm going to go for the oh. dance party. So, yeah. Okay, you know. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. No, no, but we are positive. I mean, I feel like, you know. We started yeah, to talk, are, yeah. imagining the future. We're gonna, we're gonna have it. I swear, it doesn't have to be this way. Because when you said pain, I, I saw her face. Oh yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like it's important to be honest about these yes. things. Yes, I'm uh, honest to a fault, but no. Also, there's so much joy, and like, look at this. Like, I think all the time. I think about how my grandfather, who worked in a whiskey factory, like, if he imagined me, would I be getting to travel the world, talking, to, meeting you? coming to like this beautiful country and talking to people about work and our dreams. Like I, I live a charmed life, truly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing positive, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this, is, this year is hard for me because I was in a temple in Hong Kong last year, Jaw of Fortune, and I get the worst luck. That's why I have the worst luck this year. But in May, I was going to uh, the whole event Marie was hosting, co-hosting in Toronto. That was the most, therapeutic week I have in maybe not only this year. Uh, it's just a lot of nice people. And there's no management, no macro management, sorry. <laughs> it's almost, it, it is very well structured, but we get a lot of trust. And so it becomes, uh, the thing we had is really depends on who they are, who were there. And there were all the nice people, of course, then it's something beautiful, but it's, I guess for her, she knows, but for us, the first timers, we were worried that what can I bring and what would happen? What if something have something good happen? But it all worked out. And I am a very like on my phone. I have the step counting thing. For me, it's either two hundred steps a day <laughs> or like twenty thousand steps a day. Uh, it's extreme, but I'm not a very natural person. Nature person. And if I go to Canada by myself, I would go to museums and other stuff. But because of Marie and Jim. We went to so many lakes, forests, everywhere, and it was so nice. Uh, I come to Canada. I'll take you around. Yeah. <laughs> I go to Montreal is a big country. You know? <laughs> we, we can do it here too, but someone has to like like kick me to do it. Like stand out, go out, eat some vegetable, which yeah. I never do. So, <laughs> so I, I really like that part. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. So stay in touch. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ceasefire. Yeah, we can talk about that. If you want to ask me about that, really happy to. And stay in touch. And I really mean it. I want to hear from you. So that's the end. Thank you. Yeah. Now we get to be people. <laughs> now we've changed the dynamic. We have one. We already have one. We're going to return these because we have one. Okay, you have one. I really like that the only. Uh, non text pages like a drawing of Tam Tams. <laughs> yeah, we, we opened it to the Tam Tam page. It really reminds me of when I was living in Montreal. Yeah, yeah, Like, for real. My friend tried to, like, unionize Cafe. Didn't work. Which Cafe? Uh, they worked at Humble Vine for a while. And they got fired. I've heard some horror stories. Yeah, yeah. Diverse attention. Yeah, they got, didn't go over super They definitely got fired for it. <laughs> That's too depressing of a story to tell. <laughs> Anyways. There was a really good one with OB. Oh, yeah. OB. Oh, yeah.